I've been stuck in bed for weeks. I've been going through a scrapbook of memories and goodies. It's now a scrap box. But I found this DVD that Bob made after I he and I'd split up. And he mailed me this DVD. I don't know who owns the copyright, but I, I got the files translated from VOB to uh, something YouTube can use. If you If whoever owns the copyright, please take it over from me. Hi, I'm Robert Burns. You know, I don't believe that William Shakespeare had the Texas Chainsaw Massacre in mind when he wrote, The evil men do lives after them. But he might as well have. Welcome to springtime in Cleveland. I wanted to do it because I thought it would be a really interesting summer job. You know, I'd, I'd worked as a carpenter, I'd worked as a bartender, I'd worked as a janitor, you know, I had cleaned toilets, and now I'm going to be in a movie. But we thought, you know, it would never be a real movie. I, I would have done it for a McDonald's sandwich back right there. <laughs> I would have made more money working at McDonald's. A semi-pro effort at best. When you're working on a picture, you just hope anybody's ever going to see it. You're lucky if it ever comes out, and you're really phenomenally lucky if it turns a buck. But to turn into something that 30 years later we're sitting here blathering away about, you know, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing, and there's no way you can predict that. Hi. Hey, how you doing there? Good to see you, Dr. Shock here, horror host extraordinaire, international horror host. Well, I like to do that, okay. How's it going? How are you? How are you? Whatever happened to the actors who played Pam, Kirk, and Grandpa? Oh, they're still around. Yeah. Uh, Grandpa John Duggan is living in Indiana, and uh, he worked for a while uh, in uh, doing some acting, but uh, he's completely out of that. Pam uh, lives in Austin. She went out to LA for a period of time and came back to Austin and started a small business. Um, and uh, she's not involved with the film at all. And she doesn't do appearances. Kirk is living in LA. He's very successful working as a set dresser for the studios. With the recent passing of the coach, James Sayup, did you guys make a comment or, you know, your feelings towards him how he was to work with? He was the best. <laughs> he was a wonderful guy. I, I was just talking to somebody earlier today. I thought one of the things that on his website really characterized his humor. He had this very sly humor. On his website, which one of his sons ran, it said, Jim Cedow has, two, has three sons. He claims to love two of them. <laughs> and I, I think he... He was a wonderful guy on the set, and, and he was so talented. I think the great thing about him was, you know, he didn't rely on a mask and a chainsaw to scare people. And he could make that transition from the sort of, you know, friendly old duffer to a very mean character. 
very quickly. Now we're getting into the program. How's my profile? When you were originally approached to do the, the movie, what were you doing at the time? I was in the Texas Film Commission, and there had already been some movies that had come to Texas, like Altman's Brewster, <clears throat> Brewster McCloud and Lamette's Loving Molly, and George Roy Hill's Great Waldo Pepper. So I managed to get, on this, get in that and do little extra parts and cast extras. And so then I heard there was actually going to be a movie shot in Austin, Texas. So naturally, I did everything I could to research it and go audition for it. I was just out of graduate school and uh, was working as a carpenter for the summer. And uh, I ran into a friend of mine I'd been in Of Mice and Men with in school. And so we were having a cup of coffee reminiscing. And this friend of his joined the conversation and said, you know, there are these guys in town making a horror movie. And it's really a shame because you would have been perfect to play the killer. So. That's all I knew. And then about a week or a week and a half later, I run into him on the street, and he says to me, you know, these guys, the one they hired to play the killer, he's holed up drunk in a motel. He won't come out, and they're desperate. So he gives me the casting director's phone number, which turns out to be Bob Burns, a guy I hadn't, I knew him in high school. He didn't know me, but I knew him. Uh, so I called Bob, and I went down, and we had this sort of vague conversation, and then he said, we'll call. I was doing Shakespeare at the time, and uh, we were coming back. No, seriously, we were doing Shakespeare at the time, and we came back to the to the theater, and they said, "You gonna be in the movie?" And we just come back from drinking beer at, at Mexican restaurant, and I said, "Of course, I'd love to be in that little movie." So we went in and auditioned, and the only thing I think of to do was do an impersonation of my certifiable paranoid schizophrenic nephew, and of course, Toby goes, "Okay." <laughs> It all ties back to Theater Unlimited, a place that you know well. Joe Bill Hogan. Yeah, yeah. Joe Bill was part of that. Uh, I was working at that, at that theater, uh, you know, in the evenings. Uh, I was doing that and got the, the word that there was auditions taking place, went to audition. And I uh, just really auditioned my butt off, trying to, first trying to get Ed's job, but they would give me, uh, they read, I read Hitchhiker one time, it didn't work. And uh, so they said, well, we need somebody to read Franklin, yeah, so like to feed lines to the guys who were auditioning for Hitchhiker. So I sat there reading Franklin over and over and over again. I got to like him. And uh, they kept calling me back for Franklin. I guess my case was a little different in that I was in the first movie that uh, Toby did, a movie that I'm sure all of you have seen, called Eggshells. <laughs> I think about 30 people saw that movie. <laughs> what I was doing, I was uh, doing a camp for uh, disadvantaged and mentally retarded youth. So I would do that, and then when my scenes would be shot, uh, what do you call it, one of those uh, Winnebago's would come and pick me up. Thank you. Brownies are free too if you get hungry. I had about 400 of them here. Not that hard to do. What do you think, Mr. Burns? Some wacky stuff, huh? But y'all all have different stuff. It's astounding. Yeah, most of the comic shows you can see the same 20 fucking titles. The more you read about it, the more you discover about what you people had to endure to actually create this film. The behind the scenes stuff, I mean, the things that they put. Poor Marylanders or and, and the red. And, 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 uh, it, Gunner had no peripheral vision when he's wearing the mask and he's running around this live song. I was being tortured, the victim, through the whole damn thing, from the cast, the crew, <laughs> the, the other actors who were jabbing, poking, hitting, and just literally destroying me or trying to. Her eye looks like a Mexican flag, doesn't it? I was due to the Cuervo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was from 16 hours, or I don't know, it was more than that. 26, it was 26, hours. 26 hours. The 26 hours, and they tell me, okay, you can go, I'm not out now. Well, I, yeah, you, know, you know, by this time, and then that's just how you look, I think, after on the 26 hour and a heated room with rotten chicken feet and head cheese spoiling and everybody upset and people getting sick outside. 
How kind of you not to mention me. Gunner smelling real bad. <laughs> <laughs> Dial soap was not in the budget. <laughs> See, they wouldn't wash my costume. They didn't want to ruin the continuity. So I wore the same clothes, same shirt, pants, jacket. Now remember, he's For chasing someone with a chainsaw. You know, a real workout. Days. He's a manly man. <laughs> Farmers and were coming over from the next farm. Manly. Farmers. Pigs were coming over. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Yeah, see, that's, that's my favorite picture. I'd always heard that, that you actually, once you had made the cast, that you had, the casting, that you aged it in a microwave. Is that true? <laughs> Ate it? No, no, no. Aged, <laughs> aged. aged. No, yeah. no, they turned that color, you know, with exposure to the sun. Well, this is a special presentation because for years, everybody's trying to make uh, authentic looking leather face masks and leather face outfits and nobody's been able to capture exactly the right thing and so people have been after me for years to replicate the original texas chainsaw massacre leather face and so special for this show official <laughs> authentic leather face <laughs> How long after the film wrapped, or at what point did you realize this film was really going to change your life? People refer to it as a cult hit, but when it came out, it was instantly because that was number three on the top ten. Oh, okay. And so it, it, was, it was an immediate hit. The three things I remember is I went up with a friend of mine to show her on, on Quick Hill Road, to show her where we were filming. And this car full of teenage boys pulled up, and they walked out to the fence where we were standing, and they were looking at this house. And one of them turned to me and said, you know, that's where they made the movie. <laughs> and I thought, well, we're going to be millionaires. <laughs> yeah, and, just, and, and, then, and then Johnny Carson came on and on his show one night, rants in anger. How dare they make a movie like Chainsaw Massacre and give it an R rating instead of an X. Simultaneous with that, Rex Reed in New York says it's the scariest movie he's ever seen. And I thought, this, can't, it, this is nothing but a hit at this point. So across the sensation at the Cannes Film Festival, did any of you guys get to go to that? No. <laughs> Toby, can you take us all the cons? <laughs> they wouldn't even give us a rap party. What's your guys' opinion of the remake that just came out? I just don't think it's a very imaginative film. I think it's about Jennifer Beale's breasts. <laughs> <laughs> That'll make a good play. <laughs> That's what Michael Bay said. <laughs> Hi. 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 I have a question for the, for the audience. You, I'm just wondering, what is it about this movie that so many of you find so, I don't know, incredible? Or what is it about it? Because everything seems to pale in terms of remakes or whatnot. What was it about this movie that you guys love? You know, it's hard to tell a non-believers, but it's much subtler than other films of its type. I would just want to say, I'm not a horror fan. He is. But I really like this movie because of the quality, of the acting quality, of the directing, the cinematography, it's flawed throughout pretty much, but 
there's an overall quality that's there that just shines through. You have to admit, though, all these years later, the film really did have enduring characters. I mean, the 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 baddies, the family, were you know, are now classic staples, and people are parodying them. <laughs> I'd like to thank my guests for being here in the lecture. Please join us in the other room. We'll be taking some meager contributions to our retirement fund. <laughs> Consider talking to our friend on the on the cell phone who loves you. Yeah, we'll see you next year. Three days, ten hours sleep. Was it worth it? Okay, that's it. If you want the physical DVD, uh, send Louise Python an email, and I or whoever takes over that account uh, will uh, figure out something.